On Sunday morning, September 15, 2019, two fishermen were going about their usual business near the dams of the Lime River in Nuquen Province, Argentina. This day was supposed to be just like hundreds before it, but fate had other plans. As they approached the water, the men noticed something unusual floating on the surface. At first, they couldn't believe their eyes, but the reality was horrifying. There were parts of a human body in the water. Shocked by their discovery, the fishermen immediately contacted the authorities. The police quickly arrived at the scene. Upon inspecting the area, officers found the dismembered body of a young girl. Among the remains were limbs and a skull. This terrible discovery immediately reminded them of the disappearance of Laura Lopez, a young girl from the city of Plotier who had gone missing less than three days ago. However, the condition of the body was so horrific that it was impossible to identify. To understand the tragedy that unfolded, we need to go back 18 years. Laura Lopez was born on November 11, 2000, in the city of Plotier, Argentina. She was the youngest of three sisters. Her older sisters, Melissa and Damaris, were 18 years old at the time of her birth. From the very beginning, a strong bond was established between the sisters, with the older ones adoring their little sister. However, fate had prepared a difficult trial for the Lopez family. When Laura was only three years old, her mother tragically died in a car accident. This loss deeply affected the entire family, leaving the three girls in the care of their father. At first, he made every effort to keep the family afloat, working hard to provide for his daughters. However, over time, the burden of responsibility and grief from losing his wife took their toll. A few years after his wife's death, Laura's father began to abuse alcohol. This led to new difficulties in the family's life, creating an unstable atmosphere at home and further complicating an already difficult situation. Despite all these hardships, Laura grew up to be an extraordinarily kind and loving child. Her ability to maintain optimism and warmth of character in such difficult circumstances did not go unnoticed by those around her. It was during this difficult period of life that Laura received the nickname that later became her second name. Because of her invariably good nature and ability to brighten the lives of those around her, even in the darkest moments, her sisters began to call her Cielo, which means sky in Spanish. This name quickly caught on, and soon everyone who knew Laura called her Cielo. The relationships between the sisters remained strong despite the age difference. Melissa and Damaris often took on the role of mother for their younger sister, trying to protect her from the harsh realities of their life. They taught Cielo to be strong and independent, but at the same time not to lose her kindness and compassion for others. From an early age, Cielo exhibited character traits that later defined her as a person. She was hardworking, responsible, and always ready to help others. Despite difficult home circumstances, she never complained and always tried to find the positive in any situation. Over time, the financial situation in the Lopez family worsened. Cielo's father lost his job due to his addiction, and the burden of providing for the family fell on the girl's shoulders. At the age of 18, Cielo started working, selling fried pies during the day. It was exhausting work, but she never complained, understanding the necessity of earning money to support the family. Despite the hard work, Cielo didn't abandon her educational aspirations. She attended night school, trying to balance learning with work. Her daily schedule was extremely tight, she would get up early in the morning to prepare pies for sale, work all day, and then rush to school in the evening. In her free time from studying and work, Cielo helped look after her nieces and nephews. She was a loving aunt, 
always finding time to play with the children or help them with homework despite her own fatigue. Despite all the difficulties, Cielo didn't lose hope for a better future. She was close to finishing school and dreamed of finding a good job that would help restore financial stability to her family. These dreams gave her the strength to continue fighting daily challenges. September 12, 2019 began as a usual day for Cielo. She spent the morning with her sister, Damaris, helping her clean the house and enjoying their time together over a cup of mate. Damaris jokingly remarked that it was the first time in her life that Cielo had managed to brewmate correctly. This small detail later gained special significance, becoming one of the sisters' last happy memories. Later that day, Cielo went to school. Her classmates noticed that she was behaving unusually. Instead of sitting in her usual place, Cielo chose a seat at the back of the class. Even more unusual was the fact that she left the lesson 20 minutes early. These minor deviations from her usual behavior didn't cause particular concern at the moment, but later took on an ominous significance. In the evening, around 11.30, Cielo returned home and met with friends. They spent time together, chatting, drinking beer, and taking selfies for social media. This meeting lasted until 3 o'clock in the morning, when Cielo said goodbye to her friends, saying that she was very tired and was going to bed. None of those present could have predicted that this would be the last time they saw Cielo alive. The events that unfolded after Cielo said goodbye to her friends remained a mystery to investigators for a long time. However, analysis of mobile phone data and other evidence allowed them to reconstruct the likely course of events on that fatal night. At 3.16 in the morning on September 13th, Cielo received the first of a series of calls from Alfredo Emilio Escobar, a 28-year-old mechanic who had previously studied at the same school as her. Over the next hour, Escobar called Cielo three more times at 3.22, 3.36, and 3.40. Data from cell towers showed that at the time of these calls, both were in their homes. After these calls, at around 4.29 in the morning, Cielo's phone began moving towards the city center and then registered her location at Escobar's house. At 5 o'clock in the morning, Cielo uploaded a story to WhatsApp with an alien emoji. This was the last message she sent. What exactly happened in Escobar's house remains a matter of speculation. However, based on forensic examination and other evidence, investigators believe that a conflict arose between Cielo and Escobar, which led to sexual violence. Probably fearing that Cielo would report the assault, Escobar decided to take her life. At 5.52 in the morning, Cielo's phone stopped sending signals. This was likely the moment when her life tragically ended. After this, Escobar turned off his phone, which remained inactive until 11.05 the next day. On September 13th, the day after Cielo's disappearance, her sister Melissa sent her a message asking about a doctor's visit for an ear problem. Receiving no response, Melissa called Damaris to find out if Cielo was with her. The sister's concern grew when it turned out that Cielo wasn't at home and no one knew her whereabouts. Hours passed and Cielo still hadn't appeared. Her phone was turned off, which was uncharacteristic of her. The worried sisters decided to go to the police. However, at the station, they were told that 48 hours must pass from the last contact with a person before filing a missing person report. The officers suggested that Cielo might be with a boyfriend, considering this typical teenage behavior. Cielo's family couldn't just sit and wait. They began their own search, contacting Cielo's friends 
checking places she frequently visited and posting information about her disappearance on social media. However, all these efforts yielded no results. On September 15th, two days after Cielo's disappearance, two fishermen made a terrible discovery on the Lime River, approximately 15 kilometers from Cielo's home in Plotier. They noticed parts of a human body in the water. The fishermen immediately reported their find to the authorities. The police quickly arrived at the scene. The first thing the officers noticed was the excessive brutality with which the body had been mutilated. It was obvious that the killer had skills in handling knives. Detectives continued to examine the area, trying to find any clues that could help identify the victim. Nearby in the same river, they found a completely torn fabric bag, leggings, and underwear. During further inspection of the area, two rings were discovered. Finally, at the bottom of the river, they found a knife with traces of blood. The police called Cielo's family to the crime scene. When Damaris arrived and saw the clothes found, she confirmed without hesitation that they belonged to her sister. This confirmation became a horrific end to the search for Cielo, turning the missing person case into a murder investigation. After confirming the victim's identity, a full-scale investigation into Cielo Lopez murder began. Investigators carefully collected all possible evidence from the crime scene and surrounding areas. Forensic experts took DNA samples, fingerprints, and other physical evidence. A key element of the investigation was the analysis of Cielo's mobile phone data. Investigators discovered that after 3 o'clock in the morning on September 13th, Cielo had been in contact with a man named Alfredo Emilio Escobar. Data showed that between 3.16 and 3.40 in the morning, Escobar made four calls to Cielo. Further analysis of geolocation data showed that Cielo's phone moved towards the city center around 4.29 in the morning and subsequently ended up in the area of Escobar's house. Cielo's last social media update was recorded at 5 o'clock in the morning when her phone was still near Escobar's house. The police also analyzed footage from 13 surveillance cameras, including city cameras, private homes, and shops. Two video recordings from the early morning of September 13th showed two individuals whose appearance resembled Cielo and Escobar. The time on these recordings coincided with the movement of Cielo's mobile phone. Alfredo Emilio Escobar, a 28-year-old mechanic, quickly became the main suspect in the case. He and Cielo had once attended the same school, although they weren't close friends. Escobar was passionate about hunting and fishing, which explained his skill with knives. The investigation revealed that Escobar had a dubious past. A year ago, he had come to police attention due to a traffic accident on Highway 22 between the cities of Nuquan and Plotier. He had crashed into a patrol car at a speed of over 80 kilometers per hour, resisted arrest, and a case was opened against him. Escobar's psychological profile, compiled based on testimonies from acquaintances and former partners, pointed to an impulsive and potentially dangerous personality. He was described as a womanizer prone to substance abuse. A former partner of Escobar told about an incident where he had hit her friend during an argument. Escobar's house was known as a place of frequent parties where alcohol and drugs were consumed. These details created a portrait of a person with unstable behavior and potentially dangerous tendencies. On September 17th, two days after the discovery of Cielo's body, the police established surveillance on Escobar's house. At 8.30 in the morning, officers noticed Escobar leaving the house accompanied by two elderly people who turned out to be his parents. All three got into a car and drove towards Highway 22. 
The police discreetly followed the car until it stopped in a deserted place near the bridge connecting Nuquen with Cipolletti. When Escobar and his father got out of the car, officers approached them to check their documents. It became obvious that the family was trying to leave the city. Although Escobar didn't resist, he looked extremely nervous. He was detained and taken to the police station, and the car was confiscated for further inspection. On the same day, the first search was conducted at the Escobar family's house on Estrada Street. It was a large plot with two buildings in the backyard that were under construction. In Escobar's room, investigators found traces on the walls which, when treated with luminol, turned out to be bloodstains. In the backyard, the situation was even worse. Among the crumpled vegetation, traces of blood were found. Blood was also found on the gates, on the right handle of a cart, and on the end of a tool. It became clear that this was where Cielo had received the fatal blow. The autopsy of Cielo's body was performed by Dr. Carlos Gordillo. He determined that the cause of death was a severe head trauma that led to internal bleeding in the brain. The blow was delivered to the occipital part of the head, causing loss of consciousness. According to the experts' estimates, Cielo had been in agony for two to four hours. If she had received medical help in time, she could have survived. Bruises were found on Cielo's arms, indicating a struggle and an attempt to defend herself from the attacker. Moreover, the forensic examination confirmed the worst fears of Cielo's sister's signs of sexual violence were found on the body. Analysis of the nature of cuts on the victim's neck, arms, and legs allowed experts to conclude that the killer had used ordinary kitchen knives. This indicated that the criminal did not have special medical or anatomical knowledge. Blood samples found in Escobar's house were compared with Cielo's DNA and that of the suspect himself. The Central Laboratory of the Ministry of Health confirmed that all samples matched. Additionally, Cielo's DNA was also found on the sneakers Escobar was wearing at the time of his arrest and on the knife found at the bottom of the river. The final proof came from the results of the analysis of biological traces found on the victim's body. One of the three samples taken turned out to be compatible with Escobar's DNA, confirming the fact of sexual violence. The murder of Cielo Lopez deeply shook the community of Nuquan and all of Argentina. News of the brutal crime spread quickly, causing shock and outrage among the population. People took to the streets demanding justice for Cielo and stronger measures to protect women from violence. Local and national media widely covered the case, telling about Cielo's life, the course of the investigation, and details of the crime. This led to intense discussions about the problem of gender-based violence in Argentine society. Activists used this tragedy as a platform to draw attention to the broader issue of femicide in the country. They organized rallies, created online petitions, and called for legislative changes aimed at strengthening the protection of women. The trial of Alfredo Emilio Escobar began in the Legislative Assembly of Nuquen Province. Prosecutor Juan Agustin Garcia accused Escobar of murder with aggravating circumstances of gender violence as well as rape. During the hearings, key testimonies were presented. Experts who analyzed the clothes found in the river along with the remains and evidence found in the suspect's house gave their testimonies. But the most striking was the testimony of Cielo's best friend, Florencia. She revealed that for several months, Escobar had been sending messages to Cielo, inviting her to spend time together and drink beer, but they had never met. Florencia had known Escobar for about five years and was aware of his bad reputation. She had repeatedly advised Cielo not to meet with him, and Cielo always responded that she wouldn't do it and that she was ignoring his messages. 
Escobar's defense strategy was to try to shift the blame to his friend, who, according to him, was his drug dealer. Escobar claimed that on the night of the crime, he was under the influence of drugs and that this friend was in his house with Cielo. According to Escobar, he heard a scream from one of the rooms, and when he ran to see what had happened, he saw blood and began to clean it up. Then he allegedly helped his friend hide Cielo's body. However, this version was not confirmed, and no evidence was found to support it. Escobar remained the only suspect in the case. After considering all the evidence and testimonies, the jury needed only 40 minutes to reach a verdict. Alfredo Emilio Escobar was unanimously found guilty of the rape and murder of 18-year-old Laura Cielo Lopez. The murder charge was aggravated by the fact that it was committed to conceal the rape and included gender-based violence. The court sentenced Escobar to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. This decision was met with relief by Cielo's family and the public who had been demanding justice. The reaction of Cielo's family to the verdict was a mixture of relief and deep sadness. Although they were satisfied that their sister's killer had been punished, it couldn't bring Cielo back or ease the pain of her loss. The public response to the verdict was largely positive. Many viewed it as an important step in the fight against gender-based violence in Argentina. However, there were those who believed that the system itself needed further changes to prevent similar tragedies in the future. The tragic fate of Cielo Lopez did not remain in vain. Her story became a catalyst for important changes in legislation and public consciousness in Argentina. In September 2020, almost a year after the murder, the Cielo Lopez Law was passed. This law mandated compulsory training on gender-based violence for students and teachers at all levels of education in Nukon province. The aim of the law was to prevent violence against women by raising awareness and changing societal attitudes. The impact of this case on public consciousness was significant. It drew attention to the problem of femicide in Argentina and prompted many people to rethink their attitudes towards gender-based violence. Civil society organizations used Cielo's story as an example in their campaigns aimed at preventing violence against women. The memory of Cielo continued to live not only through the law named after her, but also through numerous memorials created in her honor. Her story became a symbol of the fight against gender-based violence in Argentina. The case of Cielo Lopez made many people think about what could have been done differently to prevent this tragedy. Critics pointed to the initial reluctance of the police to take Cielo's disappearance seriously, emphasizing the need for a more prompt response to such cases. Others focused on the social factors that might have contributed to this crime, the problems of alcoholism, poverty, and gender inequality faced by the Lopez family highlighted the need for broader social reforms. The lessons learned from this case included the need for better education on gender equality, strengthening security measures for women, and improving the response system of law enforcement agencies to cases of missing persons. This tragic story of Cielo Lopez serves as a stark reminder of the ongoing struggle against gender-based violence and the importance of societal vigilance and systemic change in preventing such heinous crimes in the future.